This conference will now be recorded. This seminar is part of NOAA's Ecofoci biannual seminar series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, and provoke conversation on subjects pertaining to fisheries, oceanography, or related issues in Alaska's marine ecosystems. Visit the EcoCoSci webpage for more information. Uh, we sincerely thank you for joining us today as we conclude our all virtual series this fall. After the new year, look for our spring speaker lineup via the One NOAA seminar series and the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. Did you miss the seminar? Catch up on the PMEL YouTube page. It takes a few weeks to get these posted, but all seminars will be posted. Please check that your microphones are muted and that you're not using video during the talk. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat and I will be monitoring these questions and we'll address these at the end of the two talks. Today, I am pleased to introduce Nicholas Bond. Nick is the Washington State Climatologist. Most of his work has been done with foci and has focused on variability in climate and atmospheric forcing of the Bering Sea, the topographical effects on coastal winds in Alaska. And Libby Lockerwell is a supervisory research fishery biologist at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. She is an active in promotion of the ecosystem-based management nationally and internationally through her involvement with the Arctic Council, the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, and the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And with that, let's begin. All right, thanks, Nick here. Uh, I trust you've um, been admiring this first slide, and I, I want you to think about whether this gives you more insight into how the North Pacific works, atmospheric, ocean interactions, and so forth, versus the, uh, what's shown in the schematic in the next slide here. And this is um, a uh, rather complicated schematic having to do with interactions between the ENSO phenomenon, um, atmospheric teleconnections, and the response in the uh, um, middle latitude. So what, which of, are you getting more insight out and uh, which one do you think is more correct? Oh, so think about that. <laughs> right, next slide. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just um, kind of my own change in thinking over the last decade plus or something about how the North Pacific works. Next slide. Um, and, you know, how did we get to this? The, more or less present situation with, you know, cold water, obviously, across the, um, in terms of SST, across the equatorial Pacific and warm waters in the, um, in the central Pacific, and note that really warm waters uh, south of the Aleutians, and we'll have a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide. Okay, so what I want to, oh, it does work. What I really want to talk about here are these three paradigms that basically um, dominated my thinking, at least about the North Pacific some time ago. And uh, we're going to briefly, but critically review them here in the next few minutes. And in particular, the first one um, has to do with this idea that the, Enso phenomena, El Nino's southern oscillation, through its impacts uh, chiefly on atmospheric patterns at higher latitudes, um, uh, the response is uh, two of the dominant modes of upper ocean variability in the North Pacific, the PDO and the NPGO. And um, so, in essence, the uh, PDO and N NPGO is a rectified response to Enso. Um, the second one that uh, among the climate community is kind of, um, if not dogma, is uh, generally accepted that the upper ocean is more a slave rather than a, much of a forcing of the um, lower <laughs> atmospheric variability over the North Pacific. And uh, finally, this last one here that the, the PDO is, you know, useful for our purposes. Right. That's not working. All right, next one. Ah, it wasn't just me last time. So, all right. Okay. Uh, and so this, um, with regards to that first paradigm, the idea is uh, here that at the bottom of this uh, 
uh, the schematic of what's happening, the different kinds of ENSO um, events, whether they're um, focused in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, Pacific versus the Central uh, Tropical Pacific, end up um, creating these systematic uh, atmospheric pressure and wind anomalies that then in turn the ocean uh, responds to. And uh, Mano Di Lorenzo, to his credit, uh, in synthesizing all the various work that's been done here has you know, put together this schematic one fault that I would take with this is that all the arrows are of the same size. And in reality, we actually know that some of these linkages are a lot more um, direct and robust than other ones. Uh, let's talk about the PDO first. Uh, just um, many folks know about it, but babies are born every day that haven't heard about it. PDO, right? <laughs> and, and, and in particular, when there's, uh, uh, it's uh, in the positive state, there's warm ocean temperatures, the color fill here in the tropical Pacific, and in a horseshoe pattern along the west coast of North America. The contours there show the sea level pressure relative to normal with a deeper than normal Aleutian low displaced to the southeast. So this is. Um, is a kind of the canonical PDO, SST, and SLP pattern. Um, just um, a little bit more about it, it's kind of repeated here in the upper left in terms of the SST um, distribution. A time series for it is shown in the upper right. For the second mode of variability, uh, which now typically is considered the NPGO, Jim Overland and I did some work in the late 90s after the PDO ended um, a long stretch of mostly being in the positive phase. There uh, it got the name, the Victoria mode, but I think it's now it's basically considered that the NPGO is used more um, and it has a, a, a pattern that's orthogonal there to the, uh, the PDO. Uh, and this is a bit of an aside, but I know some of the folks that are uh, part of this talk are probably interested about what's going on in the uh, North Pacific right now, in particular uh, just south of the Lucians. And what is um, being recognized is some of these um, the SST anomalies actually extend quite deep into the ocean, and um, not all of them. And in particular, the uh, anomaly that's there just south of the central Aleutian is a box that's indicated. You can see the time series in the bottom left there that those temperature anomalies are extended down um, below 200 meters. And so what, is, what impacts the temperatures at the subsurface can be um, different, of course, than there at the surface. And there's um, a kind of starting to be at least some increased attention on that. Um, and uh, for example, if you look again at the PDO in terms of an SST based index versus uh, on the upper left versus the lower left, uh, one that has to do with the heat content of the upper 300 meters, they're very similar to one another, but of course the uh, greater amount of thermal inertia with the depth of average temperatures uh, shows a much um, slower cycle, uh, or uh, less year to year variability. All right. But what I really want to get at here is this paradigm that, okay, and so atmospheric teleconnection um, uh, changes in the Lucian low, and that's how the, um, the ocean temperatures respond. Uh, and there's some really interesting work that's been done by um, a new research scientist in the SI department at the UW, Rob Wills, who has um, used um, a kind of a, de a technique that hasn't been used uh, very often called low frequency component analysis. I'm not going to get into it too much, the details, but the, the idea there is he's trying to separate out the modes based on their time scale of variability. 
and argues that there's a mixture of those modes if you don't do it right. And so in particular, there's the uh, LFP1 that shows basically the climate change mode, right? You can see the, its time series over the last 100 plus years, temperatures are rising in the North Pacific. Okay, so that's the real slow mode. His mode, um, his version of the PDO, PDO star, shows the typical pattern of the PDO, as shown in the upper right, and the, the time series that um, is generally associated with that. Um, and then finally, he has a uh, kind of a, a different kind of ENSO modes of focusing on the, the higher frequency variability there um, that again uh, very much looks like uh, Nino 3.4 index, big events in 82, 83, 97, 98, and so forth. The key part of his analysis, is the sea level pressure anomalies. Think of along your cookies here. Ah, there we go. Associated with um, these three different uh, kind of leading modes of variability, the way that he's teased it out. In, uh, in the upper uh, middle there is the kind of global warming mode that shows basically uh, slight changes in uh, rises in sea level pressure over the mid-latitude oceans, kind of lowering pressures over land where it's warming up faster, makes sense. When you look at the sea level pressures on the left, regressed on these two different PDO indices, so at the bottom, the traditional one, and um, in the middle there, this, this new one, they look very much the same. Deep pollution low, you get a positive PDO and you know, vice versa. What's key here is when you look at the response to El Nino and La Nina in this new way, that instead of the lower right, um, a large response in terms of pollution flows uh, with respect to ENSO, there's a much more muted response with this uh, new way of looking at. And who makes the argument that, yeah, this connection between pollution low and um, the PDO is really strong, but El Nino's La Nina events don't actually, when you look at it the right way, don't express as strongly on North Pacific atmospheric variability as as uh, other folks have, have tried to uh, you know, argue. Um, you know, just recent support for that is if you look at uh, pressure anomaly maps over the last four winters, these, these numbers here, the 0.8, minus 1.0, and so forth, have to do with the Nino 3.4 index. Last two winters, Nino, um, uh, La Nina winters, you know what La Nina means, it's Spanish for the Nina. Higher pressure than usual over the North Pacific, but here in a week, weekly warm in a situation three years ago, it looked kind of the same, but when there was actually a week to moderate El Nino four years ago, that doesn't look like the mirror of these images, and just so an example of um, how this, um, you know, this pattern isn't as robust as maybe we've all claimed it is. All right, so um, that's paradigm number one. The next two I'm going to go over really briefly, and the, the first one, or the second one in my list, is the idea that the ocean is a slave to the atmosphere. And um, here I'm using some work uh, from a recent graduate in the outside department at UW who looked at the marine heat wave in the Northeast Pacific in 2014 to 16, the blob. And in particular, why, how did it last so long? If you have a, a mass of anomalously cold or warm water, it's, it's gonna generally, all things being equal, if it's warmer, it's gonna radiate more heat away. If it's colder, it's not gonna radiate as much heat to the atmosphere as it would. 
And so what, uh, what helped maintain that? And what she showed over the course of the two plus years that it lasted, that sure enough, the surface fluxes were to, to cool the ocean once it got hot. And that makes sense that the, you know, the atmospheric variability coming by the atmosphere kind of reset itself. And so the ocean, there was a cooling effect, just losing the heat, mostly for evaporative cooling. But um, what also happened was that the atmosphere responded to the ocean in the way of the cloudiness. That warmer ocean meant uh, less low stratus clouds, more high clouds, and um, it, it ended up a, kind of a warmer, more moist atmosphere in general. And what that meant was that there was greater downward long wave flux from the atmosphere due to the atmosphere's response to the ocean, less net cloudiness, more short wave getting down to the ocean surface. And while it was warm and radiating more heat upwards in the net, the, um, the effect of the, of the ocean on the atmosphere meant fewer clouds, more radiated heating, and a mechanism for you know, maintaining the heat wave. And we, we've uh, actually seen that some other spots also. All right, last point, and then I definitely wanted to give Libby enough time here, is this whole idea about the PDO is really useful for, you know, kind of characterizing the physical system for fishery purposes. Mike Litzo has done um, uh, some work on this that I think is uh, very illuminating. I've tagged along on some of it. And in particular, when uh, the charts here shown on the left show for three different eras what the relationship was between the PDO and uh, various um, salmon catches in Alaskan waters. Four different um, species were considered they're not a chinook to really do this properly, I would say. And so essentially there was a, there was a different kind of relationship used to be the catch anomalies and the PDO in these different eras. And so any sort of relationship you have based on one era, obviously isn't gonna work necessarily very well for the other one. Um, another way of looking at that is just the correlations between um, sea surface temperature patterns and catch during these various eras in Alaskan waters during that 1965 to 1988 period. Uh, warm temperatures were better for salmon. The, the red colors, uh, just nothing much during that 89 to 2013. And then it kind of reversed here in the 2014-2019 period. And so the, the relationships between the SST distribu anomaly distributions and the salmon catches just were not stationary at all. It actually makes sense, and this act, oh, perhaps goes back to, you know, maybe the first point there. When you at, uh, look at the atmospheric forcing patterns vis-a-vis um, -vis these indices during the different eras, and here I'm just kind of going to concentrate here on the kind of earlier era up to 1988 and uh, 13, 14 years after that. And in particular, when the PDO was positive in the earlier era, the sea level pressure anomalies were close to the Alaska Peninsula. In the later era, they were displaced much further to the southeast. So there was a different pattern vis-a-vis -vis the PDO in the two different periods. Same thing for the NPGO um, you know, with the charts at the right showing um, the, kind of the difference between the two eras. And so um, the screening message is, uh, you know, non-stationary relationships both in the physics here and apparently at least in one uh, way that's manifested in terms of biology. All right, so my last slide here, I could say that um, by uh, the, this first paradigm, it's by no means settled um, here, just um, 
you know, the, uh, but overall, I think the idea that the PDO is just a result of a low pass filtered inso, there are some real problems with that. So we, we still have to sort this out, and there's a lot more to it. Um, there is some evidence that, at least in the thermodynamics, that the atmosphere really does care what the ocean is like underneath in the, uh, in the mid latitudes in the North Pacific. And, um, and then finally, that, um, that don't put all your eggs in the PDO basket. And with that, um, I think uh, we could turn it over to Libby. I could um, have some questions. Yeah, let's take some questions while we do a transition over. Do you have any questions from the chat or the audience? So, Nick, regarding your second point here, so if it's not totally slave to the atmosphere, what what does the ocean do? I mean, I think you showed an example of the cloud yes. feedback. Other than that, in yeah, uh, I'm glad. Uh, so the question was, uh, you know, to the extent that the ocean is not uh, a slave to the atmosphere and actually has some important, um, you know, impacts on the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah and certainly in the thermodynamics, uh, it does where the atmospheric boundary layer, in a way, kind of equilibrates to the uh, low, the ocean temperatures below. <laughs> Um, and so uh, uh, definitely in the thermodynamics, in terms of how it impacts pressure patterns in the winds, that's more complicated. And it turns out probably in the Western Pacific, there's a little bit of a response of that sort. So I, I think you should think of it is that uh, uh, the atmosphere clearly responds thermodynamically and uh, maybe to an extent uh, um, in terms of uh, its circulation anomalies but probably to a lesser extent. Our temperatures in Western Washington are impacted by ocean temperatures along the coast. When we had the uh, really warm ocean of the blob years, that's the year we had the warmest winter on record and terrible snowpack. So that's no coincidence. Any uh, question online or? Yeah, if you, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Uh, you know, I'm. This is in my area of expertise, so I'm, I may struggle here a little bit with the concept. Um, yeah, the uh, I've always understood it to be that the Aleutian Low pretty much dictated uh, the weather pattern in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. And as the Aleutian Low weakened, uh, another front, and I saw this in a couple papers, called the ridiculously resilient ridge apparently the front from california and the north pacific moved in to to take its place and kept it kept the aleutian low at bay and supported that warm blob event uh those terminologies are different uh than what you're using here but is that ridiculously resilient ridge part of the pdo and uh, um, you know, it's manifestation in the blob, not really. But uh, you hit on a, an important point that's worth emphasizing, that there is a very robust relationship. However, the Aleutian low gets deep or um, uh, higher pressure than normal, weaker than normal, there will definitely be a response in the ocean, a systematic response in the ocean associated with them. you have subtly winds there's going to be warmer air temperatures um <clears throat> emily hayden showed that in the ecofocus seminar some weeks ago for the uh, the bering sea um it, uh, the, the key there is what makes that illusion low either strong or weak and that's the part that the new evidence is suggesting and so maybe not playing as um systematic a role as we once thought. Well, you're right, uh, that once you have an illusion low that's deep, you're going to have um, a fairly, um, you can know what the weather's going to be like in Alaska and what the SST response is going to be. 
So is it right? Is it incorrect to just to make it short? The uh, dilution low is going to allow for warm water events like the warm blob to persist. Uh, yes, uh, it wasn't uh, quite the classic PDO pattern that was at least the onset of the blob. And uh, we don't have enough time to get into the distinctions there. But uh, yeah, certainly a deeper elution low, you tend to have more warm air, um, maritime origin pumped up into Alaskan waters in the continental of Alaska, and that leads to warm conditions. Thank well, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. We can take some more questions at the end, um, but I would like to introduce Libby Lagerwell. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, hello, everyone. Great to see you and great to see the online audience as well. Let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. So I'm Libby Lauderwell, and I was very fortunate to be part of the author team on the fifth National Climate Assessment. I'll be talking about that today. And I'd like to acknowledge the Alaska chapter lead, Henry Huntington, and this whole suite of excellent folks that helped write this chapter. So here's my and but therefore slide. So climate change is a global crisis and has the potential to impact all facets of society. But many publications about climate change are not accessible to the non-science public. Therefore, it is critical that information on climate change and the impacts on society be provided in a way that the non-science public can understand and appreciate. So that's actually going to be the focus of the first part of my talk, is how we wrote the Alaska chapter of the assessment to facilitate understanding and appreciation. And then I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some examples where eco foci science was brought in to the assessment. So what is the National Climate Assessment? The agency responsible for the ass uh, assessment is the U.S. Global Change Research Program. That's a national program that coordinates the work of these 13 federal agencies you see here. The assessment is published about every four years, and the target audience is, first of all, the president and Congress, but also the public as broadly as possible. The assessment is divided up into sections. The first part is about the physical science, uh, so uh, climate trends and earth system processes. And then there are a number of sessions on, uh, sections on national topics, so atmospheric stuff, there's uh, uh, information on terrestrial processes, marine, coastal, and offshore, a uh, section on the economy, society, ecosystems, and also the human dimension, health, um, and even international interests. And then there are regional sections. So there's a Northwest US, Southwest, Northeast, Southeast, Middle, Central, and then Hawaii, and Alaska. So Alaska, I guess, is all home chapter. And that's the one I was lucky to help write. So, as I said, I'm going to talk about how we wrote the chapter to facilitate public appreciation and understanding. So we kind of inverted the typical structure of the narrative about climate change effects on society. So typically when we talk about climate change effects, we go, this is what happened in the atmosphere, it affected the ocean, it affected temperature and salinity, primary production, we work our way up the trophic chain to humans. For the assessment, we did that backwards. So we started with what are the societal impacts that we're seeing? And then we discussed the climate drivers and then you know, down to the physics. The other thing we did is arrange our sections within the Alaska chapter, not by trophic level or um, atmosphere ocean, but by these key messages that again are very societal. So our health, communities, our livelihoods, our built environment, our natural environment, and then our future. We wanted to have um, something that was a little bit optimistic about what we might see in the future, what adaptations might be possible. And I work mostly on the our livelihoods section, Alaska Commercial Fisheries, and also on our natural environment. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about those two sections. 
So our livelihoods. This is kind of how the story went. We first said climate impacts have had severe socioeconomic consequences. For instance, there have been fishery restrictions, closures, and federally defined fishery disasters. The way um, the mechanisms as far as the biology of the fish and crab have been through their growth, survival, distribution, phenology, etc. And then the ocean climate processes have been warming, that have contributed to these, have been warming, loss of sea ice, green heat waves, et cetera. And then we close with some suggestions about potential adaptations to a feature like this. So changes in science survey timing and locations, also ways that the industry can adapt through harvest timing and targets, and also the whole idea of management. So you can see how that's a little bit backwards change the fisheries. So the other key message I worked on was our natural environment. And this is kind of how the story went in that section. We said ecosystem goods and services have been and are likely to be diminished by climate change. And climate change has impacted fish, crabs, seabirds, and marine mammals. I should say that there's also a terrestrial analog to these, this story. I'm just telling you the version. Um, uh, so climate change has impacted these marine ecosystem goods and services on that uh, the things that have impacted the entire food web are ocean warming, record load sea ice, and ocean acidification. And our recommendation is that careful management of Alaska's resources is necessary to avoid any additional anthropogenic stress in addition to the climate. Some other things we did to uh, make the story more compelling is um, clearly there's a trend in climate change impacts, but we really wanted to focus on extremes and notable events. And this is a very rough first draft of the figure that you will see in the assessment. And um, we picked out some kind of recent highlights. So for instance, the blog, which we heard about. Uh, we also talk about, for instance, uh, record low uh, winter sea ice in 2018. And as I said, there were also terrestrial examples in the chapter. So for instance, the heat wave in Southwest Alaska or this Arctic terrestrial summer precipitation and flooding. Another figure we're gonna have is kind of mirroring that, some major recent ecological changes. So you're familiar with a lot of these, for instance, the blob-driven Pacific peacock collapse, or uh, unusual mortality events of seals and seabirds in Bering Sea, or like maybe here, uh, changes in the distribution and migration of moose and caribou in the Pacific. So again, we're hoping this will make the chapter more compelling to the public at large. The other thing we've done is throughout uh, the sections, we've scattered in stories. So this is a story I think that comes in the Our Natural Environment section, and it uh, talks about how the Gulf of Alaska fishery had very poor returns uh, to salmon fishery in 2021. So we have quotes from different people involved in this fishery. So from George Anderson, who's a resident, uh, talked about how they had something they took for granted, the fish were always going to be there for smoking, salting, freezing, and to have that not be there is something they weren't prepared for. Um, in this story, they also talk about how Alaska Native communities really rely on salmon, not just for food, but as an important cultural connection to place and family. So that's just one example of a story. There's also been a lot of opportunities for public input and comment from the very beginning. So for instance, in January 2022, before we even wrote the first draft, we had these public engagement workshops. Uh, they were free and open to the public. Uh, we started off by providing an overview of the program and the climate change assessment process. And we um, discussed with the audience potential topics and priority issues and talked about sharing resources, information about what's going on. And we asked them, 
how would you use a national climate assessment? What would you like to know? And, and we held uh, these workshops in plenary and breakout, and the breakouts were really interesting. I had a very great discussion. And my group really focused on extreme events, which you can see became a key topic in the assessment and also the need for monitoring. There's a lot of discussion about that. Okay. So if you're interested in getting involved, you can in a number of different ways. Um, the draft is out for public comment now, so you can go to this website and provide your comments. You're welcome to contact me or Henry Huntington, the chapter lead, if you have any thoughts. And then finally, there's a really cool opportunity. They're having an art and climate competition, both for under 18 artists and adult artists. Um, go here and you can see, and you can submit some original artwork to be considered and it would be included in the assessment. And I think now I'm gonna talk about science. <laughs> Just couldn't resist. <laughs> so, um, eco-foci research is scattered throughout the climate assessment. And I'm just going to talk about two examples. So, one, pollock in the Gulf of Alaska blob, and then also Arctic food web responses to recent warming streams. Next slide. So, we know about the blob. Thank you, Nick, for the introduction to that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, here's our study area in the Gulf of Alaska. Here's the anomalies of sea surface temperatures showing warming throughout the year, starting around 2015. Next slide. And I'm going to show a bunch of work on a bunch, from a bunch of different people. And oh, the citation went away for this. Let me see, let's go back. Slide. Okay, good. Yeah, here's the names. So all the different authors that contributed this work: Lauren Rogers, Matt Wilson, Janet Duffy Anderson, Dave Kimmel, and Jesse Lamb. So that extreme warming had an effect on uh, juvenile pollock density, productivity, and mortality. So the top slide here is uh, larval density and age zero density in 2015. You can see it's quite low compared to other years. And then uh, larval productivity, also very low. And then mortality from age zero to larvae was quite high. Next. Pollock condition. Uh, of the age zero in the fall, very low in 2015. And the pollock diet was affected. So here we have diet in 2013 before the warming, in 2015 when it was warming. And this is diet by size of fish from 30 millimeters to 80. And I want you to focus on the red bars, that's the large energy rich euphasids. And here are the smaller copepods and ochre. <laughs> and uh, you can see that for all but the largest fish, there was a decrease in new thousands in the diet of the forming and an increase in the smaller body copepods. Next, please. And that had effect on pollock bioenergetics. So this slide shows um, the daily ration, ration required for positive growth for 50 millimeter fish, 60 millimeter, and 70 millimeter, 2013 to 2015. You can see for all sizes, uh, the ration was higher in the warmer year. This colored bar represents the amount of that increase in the ration that was due to an increase in temperature, that would increase the ration, a change in diet, lower in the energy dense prey, and then a change in body weight. And so you can see, especially for the uh, smaller fish, the change in temperature and diet is really important. And then finally, um, the next thing, uh, example, uh, moving up to the Arctic, is um, Arctic food web response to recent warm extremes. So here we are now moving up to the Chukchi Sea. These are sea surface temperature anomalies on the Chukchi shelf, starting around 2015. 2015 and forward also uh, anomalously warm conditions. Next, please. And that had an effect throughout the Arctic food chain. So starting with copepods, this is work by Adam Spear and Dave Kimmel. Uh, there was a decline in the large body of Calamus glacialis. So here's a scale bar for reference. So a decline in large body of Calamus and an increase in small body, so pseudocalamus. 
and that had an effect up the food chain on the predators of those plankton. So Arctic cod had uh, significant impacts on their. Um, so this is work by Louise Copeman. Um, shows morphometric condition, lipid density, storage lipids, and then a marker specific to Calanus prey. Um, the warm before the warming, 2013, and then two years of warm conditions, 17 and 19. So although there was no change in uh, morphometric condition, there was a decrease in lipid density, a decrease in the amount of storage lipids, and a decrease in the markers for Calanus prey. So going up the food chain. Uh, next slide. Uh, true not just for Arctic cod, but for other Arctic forage fish. This is um, work by Johanna Page. Um, so you can see like in this warm period here, uh, this is uh, the, depth, the residual of length to energy density relationships. Um, and you can see that in this current warm phase, um, this uh, energy density residual was low. Um, across uh, most of these taxa, and this patterns are somewhat similar, which Johanna interprets to mean there's some kind of common blue web effect, thinking about those copepods. Uh, next slide. Um, going further up the food chain, uh, there were seabird die offs in the Bering Strait region. Um, so this figure shows the encounter rate of dead birds on beaches from 2009 to 2020. This shows survey effort. So you can see that the increase in the number of birds found is not due to an increase in survey effort. And these last three years had quite a high number of dead birds found on the beach. Next slide. Also seeing a decline in ice seal condition in the Northern Bering Sea. So this is uh, spotted seal, females and males, um, condition of adults, subadults and pups. And you see it in the pup body condition, which is probably a reflection of the mother's forage resources. Uh, the pups are not weaned yet, but they're relying on the mothers. Their condition are going down. The mother's probably having a hard time finding sufficient food to provision herself. Okay, next slide. Okay, so <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And Thank you so much. We do have a question in the chat from James. Um, he's asking about what the future time schedule is. What is future time schedule? And it was right around when you were talking about beginning half of your before you got into the science. What is the future time schedule? Yeah, that's I'm James. Sure. James, can you uh, elaborate? And while we wait for that, we can take any other questions we might have. It could be the review period. Yeah, what the, uh, what's the time schedule for the publication of the oh. report? Uh, Good question. Thanks, Jim. The pub report should be published in about a year, so fall of 2023. Uh, uh, but um, the review period it, it doesn't so, go on for that much longer. No, it's like, I think it's the end of January. Yeah. 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 So if you want to do uh, get your comments <laughs> in, do it now. We have another question in chat from Heather. Are there any indigenous or local authors on the report? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. They're relying heavily on our indigenous and local colleagues for the stories, um, you know, really trying to focus on the human impact. Um, so, yeah, definitely a big part of the team. Go ahead, Billy. Is there going to be any targeted outreach for disseminating this report to? Yeah, good question. So the question was whether there'll be targeted outreach for disseminating this report to the communities. We actually have a meeting next week. We have an outreach coordinator and we're starting to put together some ideas for that. So if anybody has any ideas for where or how to get the message out, um, I'm going to be happy to chat with you. Yeah, Libby, you might. Uh want to talk some more to uh, Gay Sheffield about uh, the societal uh, impacts, if you haven't already. Uh, uh, the, our, the NOAA administrator, when he was in uh, Alaska, was really uh, impressed by the fact that the uh, processing 
plant had shut down uh, because of lack of uh, product, basically crab and, and uh, Yukon salmon. Right, right. Good, good suggestion. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Nate. Thank you, Nick and Libby. You both mentioned the importance of recent extreme events for having impacts on ecosystems and fisheries. Can you talk more about the seasonal variations of which extremes have been most impactful? Spring, summer, winter, fall. I've been really surprised by recent extremes in summer and how impactful they've been. Nick, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think oh, about it. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, not a simple question. Um, yeah, um, I, one thing, one size doesn't fit all, clearly. And, and so there would be, um, we know, for example, in the Barents Sea, you know, the key how sea ice is in the winter is, is uh, really important. But uh, conceivably, other times of year, uh, spring conditions in the Gulf of Alaska and, you know, whether you get a sustained bloom or something might be, um, you know, more important in those waters. Mm -hmm. And so that's not much of an answer, but that's what I can come up with. Yeah, that, that's a good response. Um, I think that clearly we first think of spring productivity and the effects of extreme events on that, but yeah, our fall conditions and how any extremes in the fall are going to affect overall winter survival for a lot of species. And in the terrestrial, um, yeah, for sure, uh, all seasons are important in the terrestrial. We talk about permafrost, ice melting in the terrestrial and how that affects, you know, winter um, travel over land. So I think all seasons are important and it's a really good point. I'm glad it was brought up because um, we could talk about that and make it clear that they are a seasonal phenomenon um, kind of embedded in the trend and in the extremes. Really good point. Something to maybe bring forward a little bit more in the assessment is to make it clear which season we're talking about. People would appreciate that. They'd like to know, was this going to affect me in the spring or the fall? It's going to really affect how I respond to this. So, yeah, it's a really good point. That's a great question. We got a lot of interest in the science, uh, art, and climate. Uh, awesome. Things in the chat. Yeah. So, submit your paintings like a hit. A question for Nick. Residual for your talk. Okay. I've, I've been pondering, it's a philosophical question, I guess. Um, if the PDO, is driven by fundamentally different mechanisms in different phases, eras, and it has different ecosystem responses and different regimes. Is it still, should we still call it an index or should it well, be? I, I, I think it still is useful in a very gross sense for um, encapsulating the state of the North Pacific upper ocean temperatures. But it, um, it can manifest, that doesn't mean that it manifests in the exact same way um, all the time. And in particular, it manifested in, uh, in at least importantly different ways in an earlier era versus a later era from a you know, salmon perspective. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't think it should be abandoned, uh, but it's just, um, yeah, a single index is going to do the trick. So we need somebody to develop new indices that capture the different states. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's uh, you can do it with indices, mm -hmm. but uh, almost need to you need to know the you know uh, kind of what the distributions have look like because this PDO could be could have been plus one point two and just um, at particular spots and it'd be different conditions even though the index was the same and uh, I guess in principle if you had enough indices you could you could fully describe it but at a certain point it's just uh, enough's enough hope that helps 
So I had a follow-up question on that. So in the Wills analysis, the first mode that came out was the climate change trend. That's right. Correct. So is that the dominant driver of what's going on now, in the sense that the, the future is... Yeah, uh, the changed. order of those modes, and I didn't explain that, was not by the variance explained, but just um, sorted by time scale. And so that was the longest time scale. Right. Okay. And um, as you can see from the time series, basically, you know, rising temperatures, it's like um, there's a less polite way to put it, but no lie, you know, if you know what I mean, I think you do. So Sean does. Right? <laughs> well, those are some great questions. We're coming up on time, so I'm going to end the seminar. And the recording. Thank you both to our speakers for presenting, and we will see you next season in spring for the next seminar series. Thank you.